Good morning. I'm glad to be here this morning after my absence last week. Glad and grateful to be back into thorough study. So let's go over some of these characteristics of Israel that Amos has written, inspired by God that has made Israel a candidate to be or to have judgment fall upon them. Israel were God's people, but they made their own way. This Israel were arrogant and proud in their monetary and material prosperity. And in the first verses in chapter 2, they enjoyed hearing of God's judgment. God's judgment upon the surrounding nations of Tyre, Ammon, Damascus, Sidon, and the likes. Yet Israel themselves were committing the very same sins in their depravity. And so God called this old farmer, Amos, to tell Israel the truth, to crack a bat behind their knees and bring them down to the ground of reality. See, their mentality was, what's right for me is right. What's wrong for me is wrong. Me, me, me. They were proud, not meek. They were immoral. They were unmerciful towards the poor and downtrodden. Money meant more than people. They were mixed up in all the flavors of religion. They claimed to be the people of God, but their lives contradicted what they professed. They still thought they were God's people. And religion today, especially American evangelicalism, have the very same traits themselves. Malignant narcissism. So Israel then, they well, they must have had a they must have had those magical words and altar calls like Billy Graham had, repeat after me and raise your hands, you know, all that outward physical nonsense. Yeah. They had something similar to that because Israel was holding on to words and ways they professed, but their lives contradicted what they say they believed in. So this morning in part 3 of Israel, and this lesson will be Amos chapter 2, verse 9. I'll begin here in verse 6 of chapter 2 for clarity. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because they sell the righteous for money, and the needy for a pair of sandals. These who pant after the very dust of the earth, on the head of the helpless also turn aside the way of the humble and a man and his father resort to the same girl in order to profane my holy name and on garments taken as pledges they stretch out beside every altar and in the house of their God they drink the wine of those who have been fined we went over these verses in parts 1 and 2 of Israel and this is the verse in today's lesson. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, though his height was like the height of the cedars, and he was as strong as the oaks. I even destroyed his fruit above and his roots below. And it was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt, and I led you in the wilderness forty years that you might take possession of the land of the Amorite. You know... Anyone familiar with Sunday school or church or maybe church attendance just wasn't for you once you became an adult, but you can recall Bible stories from vacation Bible school? Anyone familiar with Bible stories knows that Israel was the theme of the Old Testament. Israel was God's chosen people, right? So God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And just like Damascus and Moab and Gaza, Tyre and Sidon, they may have caroused around, making their own way, just as Israel did, living in disobedience for a time, while also being under the sovereignty of God for a time. You see, God will allow disobedience for a while, but the while, while that while lasted, 
will eventually be dealt with. There's a line drawn by God. A line drawn in the spiritual sand, if you will. A line drawn. And God knows where that is. With individuals and with nations. A country of peoples as a whole. And in this morning's lesson, Israel has forgotten about their past. All the favor from God. How historically God had delivered them from the Amorites. How God had delivered them from the Egyptians. And they had also forgotten, which we'll go over in next week's lesson. But they had forgotten the faithful men that God had given them over the years. Like prophets and Nazarites. Not Nazarenes. God gave them Nazarites. So God is now taking the role as a... Uh, uh, God's taking the role like a, a prosecuting attorney. The line has been drawn. Drawn in the sand. And nothing can reverse the circumstance. So Israel here forgot that they didn't have to fight. That God fought their battles and engagements. They didn't have to fight. And when you're not having to defend yourself, and you're not having to, to fight all the time, verbally or physically, well, humanity tends to become lackadaisical in the flesh. They didn't have to fight those Amorites. Let's read verse 9 again. And this is Amos speaking on God's behalf. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them. Though his height was like the height of cedars, and he was strong as the oaks, I even destroyed his fruit above and his root below. See, there's not going to be any edible fruit in a tree if the roots are soaking up contaminants, herbicides, pesticides, if the roots are corrupt, right? The Amorites were tall as the cedars and strong as oaks. God destroyed them at the root. Therefore, the fruit was destroyed. Now think of that analogy of a tree for a second. Have you ever tried to bust a piece of green oak with a splitting maw? Strong as oaks. Have you ever stepped around the side of a cedar tree line of a windbreak? And have that wind slap you in the face and take two steps behind that cedar row? The height of cedars. So, God stopped the Amorites from being a people. For they would not produce anymore, and they wouldn't be around to harass Israel anymore. Not only did God take care of those Amorites, He did business for them, took care of business with those Amorites for Israel, but God destroyed them, historically, their root and their fruit. See, the Amorites wouldn't be a scourge to Israel anymore. And this is the account encounter referred to here when God destroyed the Ammonites here in Joshua chapter 10 verses 12 through 15. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered the Amorites before the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still in Gibeon, and O moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky, and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day? And there was no day like that before it, or after it, when the Lord listened to the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Then Joshua and all Israel with him returned to the camp to Gilgal. So in verse 9, God said, So I destroyed the Amorite before them. 
though his height was like the height of cedars, and he was strong as oaks. The story in the 13th chapter of the book of Numbers, many of you are quite familiar with it. According to Caleb and the other ten spies, they went into the promised land, Canaan, before the Israelites actually took it over. Ten of them go in, and then they come back with a bad report. And only Joshua and Caleb bring back a positive report. And Caleb, as it's recorded, says, let's go take this land. We can claim it. We can overcome them. Let's go get this land. And the other ten, well, then being fearful, these ten said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. These Amorites were giants. They were giants. Some translations say they were Nephilim, the fallen ones. And they say, we were like grasshoppers in their eyes. So when it said the Amorites' height was like the height of cedars, well, it's referring back to that time recorded in Numbers chapter 13 in particular. So back to verse 9. I even destroyed the fruit above and the roots below. In Second Chronicles chapter 20, it records the story that God tells them that all you have to do is stand. All you have to do is stand. You won't have to lift a finger. I will battle for you, Israel. Just to appoint some singers and appoint some musicians to go before your army, praise me and worship me, the Lord your God, and I will discomfort the enemy in front of you. That's all they had to do. So here in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 14-17, through 17, Listen, all Judea and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, they will come up, by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Uriel. You need not fight in this battle. Station yourselves, stand, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. And then jump down to verses 20 and 23 of Second Chronicles 20. They rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoya. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire as they went out before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord, for his loving kindness is everlasting. When they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who had come against Judah. So they were routed. When Judah came to the lookout of the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude. And behold, they were corpses lying on the ground, and no one had escaped. So you see, the strong emphasis here on the posture of worship and the strong emphasis on the posture of praise when Israel were facing their enemy. So we today, are we in spiritual concert, internally, spiritually, praising and worshiping God? What are we? What are we besides an army or an enemy as did Israel? 
What are we facing today? What? Bills can't be paid? A backstabber at the workplace? Maybe you've got some kind of little mental demon going on? Marriage complications? What do, what do we what do we have that we're facing? Hmm? Whatever it is, face it with praise. Acknowledge that God, Jesus Christ, is your deliverer, is your rock, is your fortress. Only He, only He will I trust, you say. See, let the Lord send a discomfort to your mental enemy. That's right. Your mental enemy. Your Hasatan. Your Beezlebub. Your Satan. Your devil. Your demon. Your red dude with the pointed tail and pitchfork. That's right. Let the Lord send a discomfort to your mental enemy. Because all these physical things, problems that are just things, we act out in the flesh. That in reality, these bills, these employment difficulties, car payments, whatever it is, have not one thing to do with kingdom living. Not one thing to do with it. We either live in the flesh with all the battles that are really just revolved around conveniences and materialism. Yeah. These battles of the flesh, the root of them are convenience and materialism. Or we will live in that whole different universe of the Spirit with Christ underneath what people see. Underneath what people see, this this pelt of flesh. It's just a pelt. It's going to die and rot away and go back to the ground and go back to the earth and to God that gave it. It's a rotting flesh. It just covers our being. It covers our identity. So we can live in this physical or combat these physical things by being grounded and exclusively living in the Spirit. Inside ourselves, we talk to ourselves every day, don't you? Don't you talk to your demons and your conscience and all that? A lot of activity going on inside a man's being. Through all these circumstances, these trials, these tribulations that we face, just like the Israel and Amos' day, live in the Spirit first, where the temple of Christ dwells. And these physical things will be just funny to you. I can say that because I've endured it. I've been through it. I know. It is funny. These physical tribulations are hilarious. Because they're irrelevant to living in the kingdom. The New Jerusalem. Till next time.